Well, good evening. Good to see you guys in church tonight. Thanks for coming out. What a beautiful day, huh? It's been beautiful. We've had a great week. I talked to my son who lives in Virginia Beach, and guess what? They're going to get four inches of rain in the next two days down there. So we got beautiful, sunny northeast Ohio. And so I, I told Bible study on Tuesday, I'm good with this till about the middle of May. All right? We can just skip winter. And uh, I talked to somebody today in uh, discipleship, and they were telling me that, that uh, talking to them about when, if the weather comes from the west in the wintertime, we're going to get a lot of snow. I said, would you stop talking about that? I don't want to hear about a blizzard of, in the wintertime. It's sunny and 78 degrees out today. It's a great day. So thanks for coming in for church tonight. What a great time down at the meal tonight. I walked down there about 6 o'clock. Usually by then, most people are through the line. There was a line down there at 6 o'clock tonight, so we served a lot of food down there, and uh, I saw a lot of people eating pie down there. So you got the sugar rush early, and then just do not crash when the pastor's preaching tonight, okay? <laughs> got to stay awake for that. Well, it's good to see you. If you have your prayer list with you tonight, we want to go over it. And uh, we have Dave Harmon in uh, Altman Hospital. pastor was able to visit him today, and he should be in for a few days and then go home. Uh, at Mercy, uh, we have Rick Lurch and Reba Reed, and both of them also have a posting uh, down on the prayer list tonight. And uh, Rick left me a voicemail, actually, around 4.30. Uh, he had a surgery on his carotid artery today, and they got everything cleaned out, and he's fine. He sounded a little bit like he was on drugs when he called me and left me a voicemail, but he said he was doing okay. So uh, praise the Lord for that. And then Reba is on hospice uh, and not expected to live much longer, so... Uh, just pray for her to have a peaceful passing from this life into eternity with the Lord. So pray for her tonight. Uh, Carol Snyder at Woodlawn and Mary Jeffers uh, at Akron General Hospital. Uh, also, uh, Brian Abel gave me a prayer request as I came in tonight. Uh, a family named the Anthony family from the Pennsylvania area. Uh, the Anthony family lost a granddaughter and daughter-in-law by murder over there and they are really going through a rough time so just remember the Anthony family uh, in your prayers tonight uh, Mission Possible reaching Perry here in 2023 Tuesday night at 6 Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock come out as we try to get through the whole area here before our friend day which is October 8th and again we want to go out on those times and visit but also we have the cards back in the back and on the on the welcome centers grab a pack and give them out. Today at lunch, pastor was able to invite our waitress uh, to it. Uh, I had, a, had one of the invitations on me. I gave it to him, and she said, you know what? I need to be back in church, didn't she, pastor? And she welcomed the, the uh, invitation very well. She did a great job as a waitress for us as well, but pastor spoke with her. She didn't interrupt. She listened well, and she said, maybe I'll try it. I, and she, she also volunteered that she didn't work Sundays, so she almost had to make a commitment to to come and be with us. So really pray that she'll come, and I don't know her spiritual status, but we pray that she'll come on friend day. Continue to pray for Julie Stewart. Uh, the surgery removed a nodule in her chest wall, determined it to be a lymph node. Uh, the location seems to indicate breast cancer, but they want to wait for pathology to make determination. So continue to pray for Julie. Mark Bulger with health concerns. Linda Greer, uh, kidney cancer's return. She's taking chemo. Uh, by pill, so pray for Linda during this time. Uh, Joyce Huntsman, uh, friend Kathy, had a CAT scan recently. Uh, pray for good results, and Joyce is nursing a broken wrist as well. Uh, Ed Kirkman, for some friends that were involved in a terrible auto accident, we want to lift them up in prayer. Terry Chapman's friend, uh, Rex, who's been diagnosed with stage four liver cancer, given five months to live. Uh, just pray for him and his family, they are believers. Uh, which they can have peace and comfort from the Lord during this time, uh, and we need to lift them up in prayer. Joetta Collins, her son is in the hospital uh, with a fever. He had surgery on his skull a few weeks ago. Doctors are running tests, so pray, uh, pray for him tonight. Candy Slater for our daughter's husband. Uh, his mom recently passed away suddenly, and it's been a big shock to the family. Uh, Mark Gamble for his sister, Vicki, with health issues, and for his cousin, Pam, with brain cancer. Oswald Chambers uh, made this statement, we have to pray with our eyes on God, not on the difficulties. 
Uh, sometimes we say we need to what? Look to the Lord in prayer. And that's not only in a spiritual way, sometimes it's in a physical way. Take your eyes in a physical way off your problems and look into the Lord. When we pray, uh, sometimes we think we have to fold our hands and close our eyes. And, you know, you can pray in any posture that you want. And here, when you read this quote, pray with your eyes on the Lord. Look to the Lord. And God will give you peace and comfort during times of difficulty. And again, we're looking at this prayer list tonight with many people uh, going through times of difficulty tonight. Be in prayer for the family and friends of Gene Richman. Passed away Monday, September 18th. Services are pending at this time. Uh, we have a missionary family in a, a restricted area that sent a, a letter to us. And they've had the opportunity in this restricted area to really share the gospel. They had an, an opportunity with nine unbelievers at one time. And they've been witnessing to someone named Mr. S. Uh, and they see, they're starting to see his heart soften. So really pray for the salvation. As our missionaries are spreading the seeds of the gospel every day. And so we need to pray for that. Pray that they'll fall on some fertile ground and that maybe someone can come along and, and water them and someone can come along and take the weeds out and there'll be a harvest one day for the faithfulness that our missionaries are showing to those uh, that they're called to their fields. And then on the back we have the Salmons in Bangkok, Thailand. And sometimes it's amazing when I look at these prayer letters that we think of missionaries and we think of something maybe different than what we do at Canton Baptist Temple. When I read this prayer letter and look at it, they've established churches and they're, they're doing some of the same things that we do. And look at this tonight, they had an mi amazing mission team come in, they had a ladies meeting, they had a special Sunday, they tried a new kind of family outreach. They're trying to build churches in Bangkok, Thailand, the same way that we're trying to build a church in Canton, Ohio. And so the one thing that we have in common is, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the method that we use to try and reach people is very similar many times, no matter what the culture is. So pray for our missionaries and pray for the work that they do in these other countries as well. Well, I'm going to pray tonight. I didn't ask anyone else to come up and pray tonight. So I'm going to pray tonight. But when I'm finished praying, we're going to see a video from Joanne Fultz, missionary in Tanzania. Joanne uh, is a widow. Her husband uh, died uh, of cancer several years ago, and she has decided to stay on the field and minister, and she's got a great ministry in Tanzania, and you'll see that video as soon as I'm finished praying, and then Pastor Frazier will come and share the word of God with us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in church tonight. Uh, we're thankful that in midweek we can come apart from the world, uh, that we can come and, and get a spiritual charge back uh, in our hearts tonight. Lord, those that have left the building on Sunday and not come back till tonight, the, the world can wear us down at times. But you've told us not to be weary in well-doing. And so we come tonight with our hearts prepared for fellowship, uh, for prayer, and then also, Lord, for your word. And so we ask that your word would minister in a special way tonight to us. Lord, we pray for each one on this prayer list tonight. We see that, that ugly word cancer many, many times uh, on the list tonight. Lord, it's something that's so prevalent in our society today. And Lord, we just pray for just uh, your special blessing on those families, not only the one with the cancer, but the families that are loving them and caring for them and supporting them. Lord, that you'd meet their needs in a special way. And that, Lord, they would see you active in their life. And also, Lord, that they would know that someone's praying for them tonight. We pray, Lord, for this missionary family in a restricted access nation. Lord, we're thankful that they had the opportunity to share the gospel with these people. We pray for these nine people that heard the gospel that one time. We pray for this one person who heard it one-on-one -on -one from them, who repeatedly have heard the gospel, that you continue to soften their hearts and they accept you as Savior as well. Lord, we do pray for our church. Lord, we have so much going on. Uh, here in the, in the month of September and into October. Uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would be hard at work here for you, that we would uh, do our part and then look at you and see the blessings that are poured out upon our ministry at Canton Baptist Temple. Lord, we're thankful that on Sunday and throughout last week we had people saved, uh, people made decisions to join our church, uh, people came for baptism. And so we thank you, Lord, for working in our ministry here at Canton Baptist Temple as well. Lord, we do pray for pastor as he comes in a moment and 
uh, shares the word of God, give him the right words to say, and open our ears and hearts for your word. Lord, bless each one who's been here tonight, took time out of their week to come and to be refreshed in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a Swahili proverb, Haba na haba, ujazi kibaba. Translated means, little by little fills the measure. John R. Rice wrote a song years ago, So Little Time. I sang that song many times during our deputation in the 90s. I did not know that I would be here in 2023 without my husband. God prepared my heart over the years to glorify him, not myself. I don't usually like to stand out in a crowd I like to be the support person behind the scenes, but God put me in a country where I stand out, but it does give me opportunities to share the gospel. Many times here in the field of Tanzania, I'm able to give little by little nuggets of the gospel to women, children, and others. God has allowed me to be available to witness Christ in these last days. Christ is coming soon, and I need to be faithful wherever he plants me. So little time. The message is urgent. My ministries here in Tanzania are with churches as a support person, curriculum translation and development, translations of Sunday school materials, gospel tracts and booklets translated from English to Swahili. I also am teaching the Bible in schools, especially at our Christian school in Olorien. I help and teach the Bible to older students weekly, teach in chapels, and help in biblical counseling at our church school. I am helping in youth activities like soccer and children's camps. I am also helping in the ladies' ministry at the local church in Olorien. God has given me other opportunities in churches in northern Tanzania. These last years, I have helped the Maasai area two and a half hours from Arusha in a bush area. They have been in a drought situation for over three years. I have collected support from my faithful church in the States to dig a borehole and equip the church and surrounding area to get 5,000 liters of clean water each day. God is so good. The gospel goes out from this church and God has provided many opportunities to witness to the unsaved in the area. Old Tukai, an area of many Maasai, are in need to hear a clear presentation of the gospel. I have provided training, material for witnessing and discipling, tracks for evangelism and provided life-sustaining water and the living water from Jesus. As the Swahili proverb says, Haba na haba, ujazi kibaba, little by little the measure is filled. God has helped me over these 27 years to give precious time after time to see boys and girls, women and men except Christ. He has helped me support others in planning churches and helped in equipping saints in their growing in Christ and in their ministries. Only through him, and my faithful supporters in prayer and financial support has this been possible. Thank you, and God bless you in these last days. Well, I'm thankful that we can have a part in the ministry of Joanne Fultz. I've been to Tanzania on several occasions, and there's a tremendous spiritual need there. And uh, I think about the fact that whenever her husband Tom passed away with pancreatic cancer, I wondered if Joanne would go back to the field or not. And uh, she decided that's where God wanted her to be. And you think about it, she's got kids and she's got grandkids over here. It had been so much easier for her to just say, I'm going to go back to the United States and I'm going to hang out with family and enjoy my grandkids. But she's right back over there in Tanzania fulfilling God's calling upon her life. So we can have a part in that as we uh, support her financially and as we pray for her uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So if you have your Bible tonight, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. I'll get there to that verse in just a moment. Uh, while you're finding Matthew chapter 16, I was going to tell you we have had some wonderful, wonderful results as we've gone out canvassing throughout uh, Perry Township. Uh, I was out last night with Lewis. Uh, Lewis and I, uh, we partnered up and 
uh, we took a street or two and we were uh, going door to door and we had some very very good visits and uh, there was uh, one where I actually got an amen remember that Lewis I said I don't know I don't even remember what I said but the lady at the door said amen and then we were walking to the next house and there was a lady on her bicycle going up the street and she looked over and said hello Pastor Frazier and I was like well who is this and uh, so then I say hey, come back here and she turned around and came back and I guess she used to be here at the church years ago and uh, anyway then I got a God bless you and then we went to uh, another uh, house and lo and behold um, the man who came to the door, he got saved and baptized here years and years ago. And uh, while we were standing there talking to him, he said, I want you to hang on just for a minute. Hold on just a minute is what he said. I'll be right back. And he went in, and he was gone for like two or three minutes, and then he brought his wife out. Make a long story short, his uh, wife has just been diagnosed with colon cancer. And, um, and they really believed that we were there by divine appointment that it was not an accident that we knocked on their door and we were able to have prayer with them right there on the uh, doorstep and uh, when we left there I, I, I said boy those have been three great visits I said uh, Lewis I got a, an amen a God bless you I was able to pray with the family and then the next door I went to they said no we're not interested we're not interested at all you know and like that and we were walking away and Lewis said you know why that happened didn't you and, he said, why? And he grinned and he said, God didn't want you to become prideful. He wanted you to, to stay humble. I tell you, Lewis, I, am, I don't know. But anyway, I always worry when I'm gone what he's going to say about me behind the pulpit. But. All right, if you have your handout, you'll notice tonight uh, that the theme is we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. Now, I understand that polls and surveys aren't always reliable, right? Have you ever thought that? You, you hear surveys and polls and you go, oh, I don't know, who are you interviewing, right? Uh, but they do somewhat alert us to the trends that are taking place in America today. In other words, uh, surveys and uh, polls, they give us a little idea of where our country is headed in the future. 63% of Americans claim to be Christian. Now, <laughs> that's a stretch, okay? Claim, claim to be Christian. Have you ever met somebody who claimed to be a Christian and you walked away scratching your head going, I don't know, I'm not real sure if they're a true blue Christian or not? Well, 63% of Americans claim to be Christian. Now, we may look at that stat and we might say, well... At least the majority of Americans are still Christian. That might be one way to look at it. And while that may or may not be true, what's interesting to know is that a decade ago, the stat was 78% of Americans claimed to be Christian. So now we can learn a little bit of a trend by looking at the stats and looking at the surveys and the polls, we have dropped from 78% to 63%. So what that tells us is that Christianity is in decline in the United States. Why is Christianity in decline when it's growing rapidly in different areas around the world? Do you realize even recently when we interviewed Bruce Burkholder during this summer and he talked about how Christianity is exploding down in Latin America and how they can't keep up with training the nationals there and they're providing all of these uh, books and resources and booklets on different issues and topics and what is going on in different countries around the world, we would say, wow, it's incredible. Christianity is really, really growing. Well. That's not true in the United States of America. With all the elaborate church buildings, with all the TV and radio ministries and the state-of-the-art technology that we use in our churches, the, the myriads of programs and ministries, and the sacrificial giving of, of Christians all across America, 
why is Christianity in decline in this country? Well, the answer is that the average American views Christianity as just another religion among many to choose from. Our country is no longer a Christian nation, but it has become a very polytheistic nation. That means that it believes in the multiplicity of gods. It's almost like a buffet where you decide, do you want roast beef, fish, chicken, uh, what protein would you like? And then there's a lot of assortment of vegetables and what kind of bread would you like? A, a roll or cornbread or, you know, lots of options. That's what America is about, right? You go to McDonald's, you got lots of options. You go to Chipotle, lots of options. If you go to, like me, if you like Bibby Bop, how many of you have been to Bibby Bop? I grew up in Asia, got to have my Asian fix every now and then. Uh, lots of options to choose from. That's the way a lot of times Americans view religion. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And they just view Christianity as one of many options. And it's sad, but the average American looks at the average Christian and really sees no difference whatsoever. When the morals and when the values of a Christian seem to be no different than the average American, why would they want what we have to offer? When the average American sees a total lack of commitment and an unwillingness for the average Christian to stand up for the cause of Christ, why would they be interested in what we have to say? Here's something that all of us need to remember. Nominal, uncommitted, mediocre Christianity doesn't attract a lost world to Jesus. We need to understand that. I don't personally want to pastor a bunch of nominal, uncommitted, mediocre Christians. <laughs> that's, that's not the kind of Christian, that's not the kind of church that is going to reach the community with the gospel. The reality is that there are a lot of professing, and I use that term professing Christians in America, but there are not a lot of true, genuine disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, I believe these words by Jesus need to be really reiterated and spoken again in our 21st century church today. We need to challenge 2023 Christians with these words. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Wow. I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to uh, sort of dissect this verse just for a moment. But when I read that verse, that does not strike me as Christianity in the United States of America. If any man will come after me, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and what? And follow me. Let's look at it in a breakdown. Number one, deny himself. That really doesn't sound like American Christianity, does it? I think it's safe to say that the average member of a church in America is extremely selfish. They want church to be the way they want church to be. And if it doesn't go the way that they want it to go, then they send an email or they send a, a text or maybe a phone call and they complain. Maybe they even threaten to stop giving to the church if you don't start doing things my way. Consequently, a lot of pastors are wearing themselves out trying to make every member happy. My job is not to make every member happy. I hate to bust your bubble, <laughs> but that's not my goal. Most churches across America have a, what I call a consumer mindset. Instead of asking the question, what does the Lord want for our church? The question seems to be, what does the consumer want? 
Instead of developing a ministry that is focused on honoring the truth of God's word and pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of ministries just cater to the selfish desires of its members. But this verse says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. When you realize that it's not about you, but it's about others, it's about Jesus, it's about honoring the truth of his word, and you realize church is not about me, it's about Jesus. It's about others coming to know Christ. Then suddenly everything changes. But all across America, we have a lot of selfish Christians where Christianity has become all about them. There's no denying self. <laughs> if anything at all, it's very much catering to self and what self wants. Notice the next expression. Take up his what? Again, this does not sound like American Christianity. Let's be honest, because the average American Christian might talk about the cross, but they certainly don't want to carry one right we're willing to talk about the cross but carry a cross no way preacher taking up a cross implies that we would be willing to go to great lengths to suffer for the cause of Christ instead though our mindset is what can I get from Jesus what can I get from the church when our when our our ministry mindset ought to be what can I give up for Jesus? What can I give to his church? Big difference. Do you come to get or do you come to give? The come to get mindset is a consumer mindset. But the spiritual godly mindset, the one that denies self and takes up his cross, comes and says, this is not about me this is about Jesus, this is about the good of others and others being able to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and to trust Christ as their personal Savior. While many Christians in third world countries are walking over an hour to go to church, the average American Christian doesn't make the effort to be in church if there is the slightest chance of rain. That's America. While many Christians in third world countries are sitting on hard wooden pews, I have sat on what they call pews in churches in third world countries that are basically like, what do they call it, a sawhorse, you know, something where you would put a, a two by four and <laughs> use it to brace it so you can saw. Oh, pitiful excuse for a pew, but that's what they're sitting on. Many of them are sitting on those hard wooden pews and extremely hot conditions. Some of them having chickens running around in the church service. I've been to a few of those. And mothers nursing babies during the service. But the average American Christian doesn't want to sit for more than an hour on a padded pew in an air-conditioned environment. The average American Christian doesn't want to be uncomfortable doesn't want to be inconvenienced, doesn't want to be annoyed or aggravated by being asked to do anything that they don't want to do. The average American Christian doesn't want to read their Bible, doesn't want to pray, doesn't want to attend church on a regular basis, do not tithe or give to their church, they refuse to serve, they believe others ought to serve them instead. And many don't want to witness to others. Is there any wonder why Christianity is in decline in America? A lost world is not attracted to any of that. Notice the third thing, follow me. The average American Christian is following after the things of the world instead of following after Christ. They're more interested in the pursuit of the American dream. You say, what is the American dream? The American dream is to have more. That's the American dream. I can have more. That is in having more of the tangible, 
temporal things of this world than to pursue after the spiritual, eternal things of God. Often Christians in third world countries where Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds, often all they have as far as clothes is the clothes on their back. That's it. That's all they've got. They don't have a car. They're hoping that one day they can own a bicycle. (laughs) They're struggling with diseases that we conquered many decades ago. They're happy to just have a roof over their head and one decent meal a day. And yet, they're committed Christians, willing to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. They shed tears of joy whenever they get their first Bible. I have seen believers in Asia that get their first Bible and they cling to it and they shed tears, never dreaming that they would be able to have a copy of God's Word in their hands. But that doesn't describe America, where Bibles are left in the back of cars all week until the following Sunday. I say, you can always tell a Bible that's left in the back of the car because this side will be really black, but this side will be all faded because the sun's been hitting it in the back window. And they leave it there. (laughs) My mother used to say, dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. Right? Many of these Christians in third world countries are willing to take a stand for Christ even when it means that they might lose their jobs, even when it might mean that they are shunned by their family and thrown at times out of the family. You say, Preacher, I I thought this was a series about the spiritual condition of our country, not the church. Well, it is. But we need to understand that one of the main reasons this country is in the mess that it's in today is because the American church is in a mess. That's one of the main reasons. It's so easy to to be in church and to pretend that the problem is out there. Right? That's what we like to do. We like to be within our four walls and we say, boy, that's just so messed up out there. I got news for you. The American church is messed up. We're part of the problem more than part of the solution. And I want to repeat, a nominal, uncommitted, mediocre church will never change American culture. Instead, what happens is the culture will end up changing the beliefs, changing the morals, and changing the values of the American church. And that's what we've seen take place in major Protestant denominations all across America that used to believe but no longer believe. What happened? They quit influencing the culture and the culture began to influence them. So somewhere along the way, the church quit being the church. And I believe it is high time for the church in America to take a stand and to speak on the issues that are plaguing our country and our churches. You see, this is not a time for pastors to dilute the truth, but rather they need to preach the pure, unadulterated truth of God's Word. The Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, and what? Out of season. That expression, out of season, means when it's unpopular. (laughs) When it's politically incorrect. What are we supposed to do when our our message is, is not popular in the culture today? What if our message is not politically correct? What are we supposed to do? Well, Paul told Timothy, preach the word. That's what we're supposed to do, preach the word. I think you would agree with me that it's certainly out of season right now to preach the truth of God's word concerning the moral issues confronting our culture. And yet we know that this is not a time to be silent, right? This is not a good time for the church to be silent. 
It's time for churches to stand on the truth of God's word. It's time for pastors to not try to tickle the ears of their members, but rather to preach the pure, unadulterated truth of God's word. We cannot just tell people what they want to hear. We have to tell them at times what they don't want to hear. I'm sure the stats that I'm about to share with you are outdated. I can assure you that probably the stats are worse today. <laughs> but what Donald Wildman, many of you no doubt have heard of him. He is the founder of the American Family Association. He said many, many years ago these words, and I believe they're still true today. And I want to quote what he says. Today, 4,000 innocent, precious lives of unborn babies were snuffed out. And 300,000 pulpits remain silent the networks make a mockery of Christians the Christian faith and Christian values with nearly every show that they air greed materialism violence sexual immorality are standard fare program after program movie after movie contains anti-Christian episodes and plots News articles condescendingly refer to the fundamentalist right-wing Christians. Those who speak out for the sacredness of life are branded as extremists. And 300,000 pulpits remain silent. Teenage suicide is the highest it has ever been. Christian morality cannot be taught in schools. But atheistic immorality can. And 300,000 pulpits remain silent. Rape has increased 700% in the last 50 years. And that takes uh, into consideration even the population growth. And yet 300,000 pulpits remain silent. Filthy music fills the airwaves and our children's minds with words which legitimize rape, murder, forced sex, sadomasochism, adultery, satanic worship, and every other perversion, and 300,000 pulpits remain silent, end of quote. I believe that he is correct. <laughs> All this is happening... And the church has gone quiet. And instead of standing on the truth of God's word and preaching out against the sins of our nation, instead we've decided that we better not mention certain things because certain members might get upset about it. When in reality, this is not a time to be silent. This is a time when pastors need to have the guts to stand behind their pulpit and faithfully proclaim the truth of God's Word. The issues that our nation is dealing with right now are really not confusing issues. Seems to be confusing to the average person out there, but when you read the Bible, it's not confusing at all. <laughs> Sexual identity, gender identity, all the confusion that exists with morality out there today. Folks, it's not complicated. You do, you do not have to stand back and scratch your head and go, I wonder what the answer is. Here's the answer right here. Here's the answer. You and I do not have to be confused about that. Instead, we need to share the truth of God's Word with others. I believe it was A.W. Tozier whose portrait uh, hangs in our Christian Hall of Fame who said sermonettes make Christianettes <laughs> sermonettes make Christianettes we have a lot of spineless Christians today who will not take a stand for anything mainly because we have a bunch of spineless pastors behind the pulpit that won't deal with any of these issues more important than a pastor telling a story more important than a pastor telling a joke or more important than him sharing 
his opinion about something is for a pastor to preach, thus saith the Lord. People need the truth of God's word. As pastors, we are to preach the whole counsel of God's word. Even the parts of scripture that aren't very popular in our day and time. And for crying out loud, if a pastor won't call sin, sin, then he shouldn't be standing behind the pulpit. We can't gingerly tiptoe around the sins of our culture. Let me make a couple of statements here. Our goal is not to be seeker sensitive, but rather to be scripture sensitive. So many churches are seeker sensitive today. Whatever the seeker wants, that's what they cater to. <laughs> but folks, we got to be more scripture sensitive. It's not what does the seeker want, it's what does the Bible say, right? What does the Bible say? Number two, our goal is not to be culture driven, but rather to be Christ driven. The culture should never dictate to us what is right or what is wrong. The culture should never dictate to us what is moral or immoral, righteous or unrighteous. The Word of God is the one that this book right here is what gives us the discernment and the wisdom that we need to know right from wrong. And folks, let me just tell you right now, if you are a Bible-believing Christian and you stand on the truth of God's Word, I just want you to know you're not crazy because everybody out there would like for you to think that you are crazy that you're in the minority that you are a fanatic and you are an extremist and I just want you to know what you and I ought to be is Bible believing Christians who will unwaveringly stand on the truth of God's Word no matter what the world says Folks, we've got to wake up and realize that we are not living in peacetime. We are living in wartime. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place for the soul of America. Now, that does not mean that we ought to be mean-spirited Christians and hard-to-get-along-with Christians. No. There, there shouldn't be a Christian here tonight that is mean-spirited or hard-to-get-along-with. It's just like when we're going out door-to-door. Uh, on Tuesdays and Saturday mornings I have found that if you'll approach a door with a big smile on your face and you'll talk nice they'll listen to you it's amazing just be nice this is not complicated is it it doesn't mean we have to be mad about something all the time it doesn't mean that we have to look like we have had sour persimmon soup for breakfast no May I remind you that the fruit of the Spirit is not meanness, it's gentleness. Gentleness. Let me also remind you that we can be firm in our biblical convictions and at the same time we can be friendly, nice people. Practice that. Practice it. To where you have an opportunity to share the truth of God's word with others. Some people, some Christians are so mean-spirited that the world says, I don't want to hear you. Get out of here. Right? But if you're a nice person, be kind, be gentle. But stand on the truth of God's word. But with a smile, you share the truth of God's word with others. People are attracted to that. We must not forget that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We're to love the world to Jesus, but we're not to embrace the ungodly morals and values that this world is trying to shove down our throats. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 19, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Right? If you are a lost unbeliever, then the world loves you and you love the world. That's where we used to be, right? In our pre-salvation days. But then it goes on, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. You're a, a saved, you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Therefore, the world hateth you. And so my first thought in this lesson is, 
And you may say, well, you've been talking a long time to give us a first thought. <laughs> but the first thought is we as God's people must not be silent. It was a French statesman who visited early America who said this, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless prairies, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. End of quote. Well, that French statesman that came over here and visited the early America, I think hit the nail on the head with his evaluation of things. The greatness of America is in our righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation. My second thought is that we as God's people must not be idle. We must not be silent, but we must not be idle. As I emphasized in my last lesson last week, we must get involved in the political process. Anybody can sit back and complain. But what we really need is to experience lasting change in America. And what that means is that we must vote in godly leaders and we must vote out ungodly leaders. We should elect candidates who stand for the values closest to the beliefs enshrined in our founding documents and who honor religious liberty and the values of the Judeo-Christian faith. We should carefully examine each candidate and vote for the one who is nearest to the principles of God's Word. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. Here in this chapter, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, saw that he was trying to do too much and Moses was wearing himself out. So Jethro encouraged Moses to choose leaders for civil service. And Jethro clearly outlines the qualities that person needs to have if he's going to serve in that capacity. I want to read to you verse 21 and 22, and then I want to give you four qualities that every leader should have. Exodus 18, beginning in verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. I want you to notice four qualities that Jethro tells Moses that these civil leaders need to have. Number one, they should be capable individuals. We shouldn't vote into office individuals that aren't capable of fulfilling the duties of that office. The Hebrew word translated able means a worker. In other words, not a slothful or lazy person, but someone who will work. They should be busy doing the work that they have been elected to do, right? That's what we want to see them do. We vote in these leaders so that they will be capable individuals fulfilling the duties of their elected office. Number two, they should fear God. We ought to elect individuals who will consider God in every decision that they make, realizing that ultimately they are accountable to God. A person who fears the Lord will not only seek the face of the Lord, but 
They will also ask for God's wisdom to make the decisions that they need to make. And they will also seek godly counsel. Number three, they should be trustworthy. That's the idea behind the Hebrew word translated truth. It's referring to the character of an individual. (laughs) Boy, that is something that my mom and dad really believed in, instilling into us the importance of being people with character. And we have lost that in our culture and in our society today. We need men and women who have character. We need children that have character. We need grandchildren that have character. That's important. Uh, The idea here is that an individual ought to be able to be trusted. We need people serving in political office that are reliable and people who are faithful to keep their promises. Right? That's trust. Being trustworthy. Fourthly, they should hate covetousness. Now, the idea here is a person who cannot be bribed. That's the idea. If a person will accept a bribe from another person, then that person cannot be trusted to do what is just and what is right. You no doubt remember the sad story about Eli's sons. Do you remember that story in the Old Testament? I want to read to you a verse, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 3. And his sons, that is Eli's sons, walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre or dishonest gain. Does that not sound like politicians today? But turned aside after lucre, dishonest gain, and took what? Bribes and perverted judgment. In Exodus 23, verse 8, Moses gave this warning to civil judges. And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. It was President Harry Truman who said, If a man comes to Washington and leaves rich, you can know he's been stealing. Oh, that's some good common sense right there. Let me close by saying this. Often our choice isn't between a Christian and a non-Christian. Right? Sometimes it's between a non-Christian and a non-Christian. But like the case of the rich young ruler. Do you remember the story about the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10? He was a good man, was he not? Seemed to be moral, was keeping the Ten Commandments, but lost. Lost. Good, moral man, but lost. And sometimes, even in our day and time, there are some lost people, some non-Christians, who still adhere to traditional values and traditional morals. Have you ever encountered people like that? Bottom line is that we have to do our homework. We have to examine each candidate and understand where they stand on the issues. That's why every election we put in the bulletin what we call voter guides. How many of you have seen those voter guides in the past? Please understand, we are not telling you who to vote for. But rather, we want you to understand where the candidates stand on the issues that ought to be a matter of concern to Christians. Here's where they stand. Now you go and vote. But one thing is for sure, we must not sit back and be idle. We have to get involved. Right? We have to. We've got to do the research on each candidate. We've got to be a a voice for Judeo-Christian values. We've got to pray for our, our country to turn back to God. We've got to know our Bibles because people are looking for answers today. There's no reason why we as Christians should be confused about the pertinent issues confronting our culture today. Be the salt of the earth. Be 
the light of the world. Be a committed Christian who will stand on the truth of God's word no matter which way the wind is blowing in our culture. Folks, we cannot be silent and we cannot sit back and be idle. We have to get involved in the process. And so that's the challenge here tonight. And I pray that you will be back on Sunday. Sunday, uh, we are baptizing, I think, five or six uh, new believers. And uh, also, we are observing the Lord's Supper together. It's neat whenever you're able to observe both of the ordinances of the local church on the same day. So we got baptism and we have the Lord's Supper that we're going to observe on Sunday. I want to encourage you to come on Sunday. Invite somebody else to come to this church. I tell people all the time, Lewis heard me say it last night to a couple of people, we don't have a perfect church, but we got a great church. Come visit our church. We welcome you. I had one lady tell me, no, I'm a Catholic. I said, we love it when Catholics come to our church. <laughs> Amen? I said, you're welcome to come to our church anytime. And so get out there and hand out those invite cards. Grab a pack of those if you don't have them and, and hand them out. You can give them where, where you go out and eat. You can give them to your neighbors, give them to people you work with, your family members. Help us build the church that God has allowed us to be a part of. Don't be silent. Don't sit back and be idle. Get involved in the battle for the soul of America. We who love this country have got to do everything we can to try to save this country. We know ultimately God is the answer, but we have to do our part. Amen? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight with your people, studying your word and being challenged about who we need to be in this country that has strayed so very far from you. God, we love the United States of America. Lord, we want to see this country repent of its sin and to turn back to you and the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, to be not just sitting back complaining about the problems of our culture, but help us to actively get involved in the battle for the soul of America. And help us to be the committed Christians that you want us to be. May our light shine bright in a very spiritually dark culture. And help us, Lord, to do our part to reach this community with the gospel. Help us as we leave here to leave here excited about what you're doing here at this church. And we pray that you'll continue to bless this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a safe trip home, and we'll see you Sunday.